if you have a Bible, I want you to open with me to the book of Proverbs over in the Old Testament. You can go to chapter 16 and uh, hold your place there, and then also Proverbs 19. Uh, we're going to be looking at two passages, and um, both passages that we will uh, talk about, I, I think are great passages for us to aspire to memorize. I think they're great memorization verses. And uh, they both say very similar things that they will sound a lot alike. Um, and, um, but I think they have great relevance for our lives and the two realities that we live with. And um, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 says it this way. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. Uh, and then Proverbs 19, verse 21, sounds very similar. Words it a little different, but sounds very similar. Uh, and it says it this way, Many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And uh, both verses point to two realities. One that we plan, and we should plan. Anybody who thinks that uh, you're filled with faith for not planning, that really isn't true to what the Scripture pushes on. Uh, we're advised and encouraged and even commanded to plan. Uh, so that's a reality. But the other reality that is even greater than that first reality is that the Lord will work out his purposes and plans according to his sovereign purposes. And uh, when we look at our lives, uh, there are going to be times that we make assumptions and uh, kind of this understanding on where we're headed and how it's going to play out and um, how it will evolve. But in the end, the Lord's purposes will prevail. And sometimes there will be a dichotomy between what we plan and what he achieves. Uh, sometimes it's going to be in the more realm. Like he will accomplish more in your life and through your life or through a situation than you ever anticipated. And you'll look back on it and say, wow, Lord, I had no idea that you were going to work that demonstratively. There are also times that we will plan and have an imagination on how things are going to go, and he will work in our estimation less than what we thought. Like, why did I go through that? Why did I endure that or feel that? And uh, what it perceives to us that he accomplished seems to be a little less, but many are the plans of a man's heart. But it's the Lord's purpose and the Lord's plans that are going to prevail. We just got through singing the song, How Great Thou Art. And how great thou art is a hymn that embodies that concept. Um, about 20 years ago, there was a poll taken amongst churches. What's the most popular church hymn? And this was conducted with uh, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, hands down, the number one most popular hymn across the globe was Amazing Grace. Uh, number two, right behind it, was How Great Thou Art. And How Great Thou Art has an interesting story. I'm not sure if you've ever heard it or come across the storyline. But How Great Thou Art really has its kind of lineage and construction credited to two particular guys in two different eras. Uh, One's by the name of Carl Boberg and another by the name of Stuart Hine. And Carl Boberg was over in the 1800s and Stuart Hine was over around 1930s. Uh, The storyline is this, is that Carl Boberg was a Swedish pastor. He used to be a sailor, but had been kind of gravitating towards ministry, had become this pastor of a very small Scandinavian church. And uh, one particular day, they're traveling home from a service. And uh, as happens in Florida quite often, a storm comes upon them very quickly. One of those ominous storms, like where did this come from? And it's ferocious and it's dark and it's billowing with thunder and lightning. And so he and his buddies kind of scurry to shelter. Uh, The storm passes very quickly, and we're probably mindful of what that looks like in Florida. Uh, It passes quickly. And he was amazed by this um, reality that as soon as the storm passed, the sun came out. And birds started chirping and flying. And there was this rainbow that followed the storm. It just, the dichotomy of it struck him. He continued to his house. He got to his home. He opened up one of the windows facing the seacoast. And he could hear in the distant church bells. For a small Scandinavian church at that time period of history, bells being rung during the afternoon would have meant one thing and one thing only, that a funeral was in procession. And so he was stricken by this reality of an ominous storm that quickly passed 
and the brilliance of sun and birds and rainbow, and he could hear of someone's home going in the distance. And he sat down and he wrote a nine-verse poem, and he identified it or called it, O Great God. And you would think that the story would take off from there, but it didn't. It was pretty innocuous after that. He didn't even publish this poem for a year. And in 1886, he ends up posting or publishing this poem. And you would think that it caught there, but it didn't. It kind of remained in obscurity for about three years. And somebody came across this poem and thought, you know, this writing would be great with some music underlying it. And so he wrote kind of this music line to it. And they began to circulate it through these small Scandinavian churches. And I would love to tell you that the storyline just went up and to the right after that, but it didn't. For about 40 years, it just kind of stayed remaining in those small Scandinavian churches within that realm. Until about 1907, when a missionary who was directed towards the German people came through one of these towns and he heard this song. And he thought, that would be fantastic to my people in the German language. So he got the rights for it, and he translated it in about 1907. Keep in mind that in 1914, the World War I broke out in Germany in that region. And so he had taken this song amidst this time that was very volatile and erupted, and this song began to circulate through these little churches within that German and Austria area. And it kind of remained that way until after the war. Uh, Historically, after the war, there were missionaries all over the world that wanted to go to these ravaged areas. And so missionaries were coming in, and there was a guy by the name of Stuart Hine that came into Poland in 1930s, and he came across this song and thought this would be fantastic in the Ukraine where he was called and assigned. And he took that song and he translated it into Russian and he took it to his Ukrainian village. Keep in mind, it's around this time, 1932 or so, that Stalin, Joseph Stalin, began his genocide, self-induced genocide that took more than 7 million people's lives. And it's within this Ukrainian area that the song is starting to circulate and trickle through small congregations. But it still kind of remained in obscurity. Until post that time, and missionaries are flooding into that area, one particular missionary comes into this town, hears it, and thinks, that would be fantastic in English, and to take it back to the U.S., and he does so, and he gets it into the hands of a guy by the name of George Shea, and George Shea was the lead vocalist, lead soloist for the Billy Graham Crusades, and he began to sing this song, How Great Thou Art, all across the globe. And you think about the history of Carl Boberg and Stuart Hine and their connection to how great thou art. And in reflection of a storm that came and passed and sun that came out and the ringing of bells of a homegoing service and in the presence of wars and famine, then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee, how great thou art. They never would have known what God would do with that. They never would have been able to ascertain where God would take that kind of thing. And it's a microcosm of what happens in our lives. We have no idea how the Lord will take our particular life and our particular stages and our particular situations and use them for his purposes. And I'm reminded of those two passages. In his heart, a man plans his course, but it's the Lord who determines his steps. And many are the plans in a man's heart. But the Lord's purpose will prevail. Last week, we began this discussion called Act 2. And uh, we talked about the reality that the Lord works in our lives through stages. There's no one in here that's exempt from this. The Lord won't work from A to Z in just one spot. It'll be through stages, and he'll show himself in different ways and allow us to be formed in different ways. We also talked not just about what happens in our own lives. We talked about us as a church and a church family, how the Lord will work within a faith community in stages. We talked about our 17 years and how the Lord has worked in stages for 17 years through us. Some have been wonderful. Some have been difficult. It's all been part of the same story at different points. We talked about last week, Act 2, that we're going into Act 2 and uh, that we're going to be expanding our auditorium. 
uh, to allow for more seats and more opportunities. We're going to be reconfiguring our office area for classes for uh, sixth grade, for new believers, for uh, a special needs opportunity, a special needs class for kids. Uh, we're going to be doing a number of things to expand and clearing out property um, you know, in the back. Uh, when you drive around our pop property, we only have that you can see about seven acres developed. We still have about 14 acres remaining behind, and we're going to begin to develop some of that and clear it out for fellowship and soccer games and all kinds of activities. Uh, we're looking also to acquire another section of land, five acres that are adjacent to us. It'll help us reconfigure some things that are going to be really powerful. And we said last week uh, that this whole project is going to cost us about a million dollars. And while that's a tall order for a church, we're also able to celebrate that over the num past couple of years, we've been working and saving, working and saving, and that we have half of it already in savings ready to go. And so that's a praise the Lord moment, right? Uh, but we're going to be looking to raise the rest of that to continue doing what God has called us to do. I'll show you a quick uh, picture really quick of what we're looking at with the rendering. I know it looks very similar to what is current. Uh, where those red lines are, the red line uh, on this section is where that wall, it, where that current wall is and what will be uh, will able to be put on the other side. And then up in the ceiling part, um, we're going to have dividers that are able to come down. They're actually going to recess into the ceiling, but then we'll be able to come down and divide for things like Wednesday night youth and for groups and for a number of things where we need essential breakouts. It's going to be a fantastic development in here and across, and it's going to be exciting. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing our giving uh, October 7th through December 23rd. If maybe um, you weren't here yesterday or yesterday, I hope you weren't here yesterday. If you weren't here with us last Sunday, uh, you know, we have an envelope that we'd love to put in your hands whenever we dismiss today. But we talked about, if I come back now into us, we talked about stages and the necessity of a church growing through stages and the necessity of our lives growing through stages. And I want to pick up on that uh, today and push on one topic with us, and that is this fact that for us, if God is working through stages, you and I are going to have to embrace, as you'll see in your notes, kind of this long-range view of things. Like, how do I get a long-range view of what the Lord is doing in my life or what he's allowing in my life? Uh, because a lot of times those are going to be challenging. And it's as though, I was thinking this week of like a lookout tower. Um, sometimes when you're on the ground and you're only surface level, you can only see what's in front of you. I can only see my boss. And I can only see this conflict. Or I can only see this stop. Or I can only hear the fight between us right now. And sometimes it's advantageous if you were able to get up on a tower way above and look and understand a few things and see further down the road then you could see kind of how the Lord is working and how he'll utilize this stage for that stage. And uh, that's our challenge today. And I want to give you just two towers. Tower number one, write this in your notes. Some stages of your life will not look anything like what you anticipated. And I know that sounds very simple, and I know that sounds like the kind of thing that none of us would debate. Sometimes when you get up on the tower and you look and you look down at your life, it's not going to look anything like what you anticipated. Truth be told, Truth be told, some of you right now are living a season, a stage in your life that is very different than you ever anticipated. I never anticipate us being in this financial crisis. I never anticipated that relationship dissolving so rapidly. I never anticipated me at this age scrambling for what's next. I never anticipated never anticipated a child that doesn't want to talk to me and won't come home. I never anticipated something health-wise. Uh, there are seasons and stages that we deal with things that we never anticipated. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's hard. Uh, sometimes it's certain and clarity that God gives us. And sometimes it's great uncertainty and unpredictable. Sometimes things will happen in your life quickly, like it just came at you fast. And then other times, you will walk through a stifling delay. 
there are some times that it will be exhilarating in joy. And there are other seasons and stages that will absolutely break your heart. And, um, and that's consistent. That's consistent with what we see in Scripture. People who were men and women of faith that followed the Lord. Um, one comes to mind as Abraham pertaining to promises. If God has given you a promise in any regard. And you're like, I'm holding on to that promise. Abraham had promises of a promised land. He had promises of a son. But both scenarios, if we study it, look incredibly different than anything he ever anticipated. Uh, We might say relationships. You start a relationship. It could be a friendship. It could be a business partnership. It could be a marriage. It could be a relationship with your kids. And you have a vision of how that's going to play out. But sometimes relationships go on to take a very different turn than we ever anticipated. I'm mindful of Jacob. Jacob thought he was going to marry Rachel. He had stars in his eyes for her. But he ends up having to marry his sister, her sister, Leah. And that ended up looking really bizarre for a good amount of time. Uh, You would think that he had great wonder about his relationship with his kids, but that took on a very weird face at times. Uh, You might think timeline. Timeline. Uh, David. David receives this prophecy, this anointing, you're going to be the next king of Israel. But then the reality is he finds himself out in a field for a great distance of time. Then he finds himself actually an attempt on his life, and he's having to flee as a fugitive. And then he's having to hide in a cave and pretend that he's lost his mind and sanity. And he's still holding on. I'm the next king of Israel while he is drooling upon his face so that he doesn't die. Looks very different than anticipated. Uh, That happens a lot in Scripture. Uh, There's a guy by the name of Joshua that this happened to. Joshua's story um, dealt with highs and lows, and it looked very different than he anticipated. Most of us in here are familiar with one particular passage around Joshua. We see it in people's homes. Maybe you have it in your home also. Uh, We'll see it on plaques and little posters. Here's the image. It comes from Joshua chapter 24, and it says, Choose this day whom you will serve. And then it goes, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How many of you have seen that somewhere? Seen that on a plaque or something? Yeah, it looks really neat. It looks really neat. It's very, it's very incomplete. Um, when you see that, and you see that in somebody's home, it's like, ah, oh, that's awesome. That's my favorite verse. It's an incredibly incomplete understanding of the passage. I'll give you a little context around it. When Joshua says this passage, he's about 110 years old, and he is at the edge of his death, and he's making a pronouncement to a nation that has been very divided in their faith, to the point that God has said, I don't want to judge you, but I'm going to judge you if you continue in this path. And it's almost as though this is a warning, a pronouncement. And then you pull back and you look at it in context to the passage. It says this in Joshua 24, verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Part of why Joshua is saying this is he will no longer be there. He will no longer be the flag waver. You're going to have to do this for yourself. Have you ever had a loved one that came to a crossroad that you said, you're going to have to do this for yourself? I I can't carry it anymore. I can't convict you anymore. I can't challenge you anymore. At some point, you're going to have to live this out for yourself. That's where Joshua is. And he says, throw away the gods of your forefathers. Pause right there. If they could throw it away, that meant they were in possession of it. He said, you've got these things. You held on to these things. Get rid of this stuff. Throw away those gods that your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if you choose not to, like if you choose and that's where you are and you're definitively saying no to God, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose. Then choose this day whom you will serve. And he doesn't say like you're going to serve God. He says you might just choose. You might in your stubbornness choose to serve the God of your forefathers or you might choose to serve the God of the Amorites. You might choose to serve these pagan gods. But as for me and my home, I don't know where you're going to cash out. But as for me and my home, we're going to serve the Lord. It takes on a whole different taste when you look at it in context. 
But the reality is about Joshua. Joshua lived high and he lived low. Uh, for instance, if I were to capsize, capsize, if I were to capsule uh, Joshua's life in about 30 seconds, Joshua was about 16 to 20 years old when he came out of Egypt into the promised land with everybody. He was a teenager. And uh, he is assigned the responsibility of being one of the 12 to go into the promised land and spy it out. He comes back as a teenager, as teenagers kind of are brass and, hey, we can do whatever. We can do it. If God said it, we can do it. He comes back with that same kind of conviction. But of his testimony, only one other shared it, and that was Caleb. Ten others had just a very negative report, and they said, we can't do it. And so God keeps them in this isolated place, the wilderness, for about 40 years. Don't miss this. He goes in at about 16 to 20, and he's not going to lead Israel into the promised land until he is 60 years old. Anybody here deal with any delays from the Lord? Yeah. Joshua could identify with you. He went from a very young guy to an older guy until the Lord moved in that demonstrative going into the promised land point. He leads them into the promised land at around 60 years old. And for about the next 50 years, there's going to be victories and there's going to be defeats. In fact, the first thing they're going to see is they're going to see the most incredible victories. It's startling. It's startling. So, so startling that most people who are not people of faith would say that couldn't have happened. God is going to take him to a place called Jericho. And this Jericho has this great wall around it. I've told you this before. The wall of Jericho was so wide that historically they used to have chariot races on it. And uh, God's plan for Joshua and Israel is go to that wall, and here's your strategy. Just walk around it. Like, do nothing. Just walk around it. Go home. And uh, then day two, do the same thing. Day three, same thing. Do that for six days. Just come to it, walk around it, and then go. On the seventh day, you're going to walk around it seven times, and then just start screaming. The people won't have a clue what you're doing. Just start screaming. And they do. And demonstratively, the walls come crumbling down. It's a supernatural work of God. And because it's amidst that, the scripture says this in Joshua chapter 6, verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Pause right there. If you led the people in that way, your fame would spread too. They had spent 40 years in the wilderness. Moses dies. Joshua is appointed. Joshua comes to the people and says, in three days, we're going into the promised land. There's been a 40-day wait. Now we're going in in three days. And then he leads them to this incredible victory, and his fame spreads. Like, don't miss this. The very next chapter, he suffers just one of the most humiliating defeats. Look at uh, chapter 7, verse 6. Then Joshua, this is a post getting throttled. Verse 6, then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, "All oh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. You have a guy that went from one peak to one valley, to one peak, to one valley, to one peak, to one valley, fairly consistently. Have you ever in your life felt like, Lord, what are you doing in my life? Going from peaks and valleys. That was what Joshua dealt with. And it becomes a powerful thing when we start to pull back and you say, you know, there are going to be times that my stage looks different than I anticipated. Uh, last week, we pushed into the visual of Broadway plays and how Broadway plays carry out different acts, an act one and an act two. And I talked about how the first time I had seen a Broadway play, I didn't know there was an act two. So a thunderous applause to this last song, and everybody's getting up, and I'm like, we're done. You know, it's early. And start to leave, not realizing there's a second act. When we came back in, the scenery had changed dramatically. Stage look completely different, new set of characters, new set of everything. Sometimes your stage, the scene changes. The Lord will change the scene. And uh, some of you are like, I never imagined being in Tampa, Florida. 
Uh, sometimes it's I never imagined being at that job or in that neighborhood. I never, I never envisioned, you know, still being single. I never envisioned uh, this scenario. Sometimes it's the timeline that changes. I never imagined that I'd still be wrestling with this. I anticipated that we would be further along. I know we're fighting. I know we have tension. I know we have conflict. I just anticipated we would be through this by now. Sometimes it's the cast of characters. It's like there's a whole new cast of characters. And you're like, it's, my problem is not with God. My problem is with everybody else on the stage, you know. And it's like I can't get along with these people. And this reality that in our lives, sometimes those things are different. And it becomes powerful, tower number two, if I'm still up in that tower. And I'm able to see that some of my stages are going to look very different than I anticipated. Then tower number two is this. Fill this in your notes. And that is that the Holy Spirit is the most qualified at initiating or redeeming your stage. He is the most qualified at initiating or redeeming your stage. Even if there are scene changes, a difficult timeline or a cast of characters that you just don't know how you can get through this thing with. Um, let me talk about that. Initiating. There are times the Holy Spirit will initiate a change in your life. Um, sometimes with your permission and sometimes without your permission. But it's for his storyline. And in his sovereignty, many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord will determine his steps. Sometimes he initiates a change. Usually those are easier and usually they're welcome. But there are sometimes that there's a change, and it's something that the Holy Spirit allows. And those are harder. Like if you've ever wrestled with this, and I think everybody, of, every one of us have at some point, where you're like, Lord, why did you allow that? Or why are you allowing that? Why are you allowing my son to get further away from me? Why did you allow my wife or my husband to abandon their faith? Why did you allow that to happen or why did you allow that to happen and um and it comes to this word that for me has just been resonating this week and it's a word that i hope and pray deeply resonates with you today and i say that very specifically i think there's somebody here today that dramatically needs this term that he is the redeemer and um, you think about this term, that he has the ability, the most qualified, for redeeming your stage. What does that mean? Uh, I'm going to show you a verse, but I want to give a little context to it. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus is walking along with uh, two guys. He has been resurrected. He is walking with two guys. They do not recognize that he is the resurrected Jesus. And uh, there's dialogue that's happening. And they make this statement in verse 21. They say this. But we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Um, that term redeem uh, shows up in the scriptures about 170 times. Whether it be through redeem or redeemer or redeemed or redemption. Some form of redeem 170 times. And when we hear that term, we typically think savior or deliverer. But it actually carried a much more poignant perspective. To redeem was to pay for something, to purchase something. For instance, I, I, I want to try and show you a visual. If I can have uh, Pastor Micah, Yvonne, can I have you jump up here with, with uh, Pastor Micah? And um, I want to kind of give just a microcosm of what redeeming looked like. We're going to say that this pillow represents a line, I fill in the blank for you. This could be a marriage, this could be a relationship, this could be your career, this could be your dream, this could be whatever. This represents something that you hold dear in life, and you're holding on to it, and then something or someone or a situation comes along and takes it. You are a bad dude. <laughs> he takes it. Now, most of us would say that redeeming if God is to redeem, is to come over here and scold and say, that was a bad move, you go give that back. And we wait for that person to come pay penance and that person to come apologize and that person who stole from us is going to rectify to us. But that's incomplete to redemption. 
Because this guy, he's a bad dude. He's not going to do it. This is what redemption is. Redemption is that I pull out, as the Redeemer, money to purchase it. When it says that Christ redeemed us, it says that he bought us with his blood. He didn't just go to the devil and say, hey, you stole their innocence and you stole their purity and their righteousness. Give it back to them. Can't do that. What he does is he's going to purchase it with his blood. He takes the ownership of purchasing that back and then giving back in some form or fashion. That's the better visual of redemption. You say, in your life, what has been stolen? What has been taken? Or what were you holding that I feel like I lost? He is the most qualified for redeeming that relationship or that situation or that loss that you have incurred. Would you put your hands together for these guys? Whether it's internal or external, whether it's a relationship or whether it's a dream or whether it's an aspiration or whatever it might be, um, he is the most qualified. He is the most qualified at redeeming. And so I want to give you a tower tip, a tower tip that if you're up on the tower, this is probably the best tip for us that I think we can have. And here it is. Write this in your notes. Feed your confidence in God. Feed your confidence in God. Now, the reason I say that is there's a passage in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, that says this. Don't cast away or don't throw away your confidence. Don't let your confidence in God get away. If we can show that. Because it says it will be richly rewarded. Sometimes when we go through difficult things, we cast away our confidence. I don't know that God's going to come through. I don't know why he let me go through this. I don't know how I get to the end of the other side. And we pull away. We cast away our confidence. And the wise thing for us to do, and somebody in here, you've got to hear me in your soul, not just with your ears. The wisest thing you could do right now is feed your confidence in God. How do you feed your confidence? Through the word through worship, through hearing other people's stories. When you hear somebody else's story, it doesn't mean that their story solves your story, but you can gain confidence. You can feed your confidence in God. When I hear the testimonies of somebody else, when I see God working actively in other people, because I can't really see it, I'm down here right now in my life, but I can get up on a tower on somebody else's life, and I can feed my confidence up here. 